Welcome back to Web Dev Live APAC Edition. Now it's been great to be together over the last two days, and now let's finish strong on day three. We've spoken about the role the web has played, with you building websites that share COVID data online, allowing work and learning to happen from home, much needed entertainment, and keeping up with world news. One of the big shifts we've seen is around retail and commerce. Now, online retail has nearly doubled its share of credit card spending, and e-commerce is now 30% of retail, growing 15% in just six weeks. There's been a flood of activity as businesses rush to get online. Pedro Freitas, head of Loja Integrado, which is part of the Vtex platform, shared how they saw the doubling of sites being created every single day. When they saw this, they kindly offered unlimited plans for healthcare clients. When it comes to food, we're back to 1992 levels of share between groceries and restaurant orders. And my omelets are certainly looking a lot better. And then there's the story of Foodla. A couple of university students quickly built a site to allow people to order directly from the local street hawkers in Singapore, bridging the online offline gap. And then there's Sebastian Carbonero, a high school student from San Marcos, California, who jumped into action to create food banks, a website that helps you find, well, local food banks. Now, we continue to be impressed with the ingenuity that some of you are displaying as you help people in need right now. And speaking of being impressed, we're really fortunate to have a really healthy framework ecosystem on the web where different approaches can be explored in different ways. Now, Vue is a popular and well-loved framework with particularly large usage in the APAC region. So we wanted to invite Evan Yu, the creator of Vue, for a chat. Hi, Dion. Nice to be here. Hey, Evan. Thanks so much for joining us. Now, I'd kind of love to start at the beginning of the, the history of Vue and the story as you've kind of gone through different evolutions from version 1 to 2 and now what you're working on with version 3. Sure. Uh, Vue started out as a personal experimental project back in 2013 and was first made public in February 2014. The initial goal was really just to create something that I would enjoy using myself. It was a very small library combining the data binding that was inspired by Angular 1 with a ES5 getter setter based reactivity system. Um, because we used getter setters, it was not IE8 compatible when it came out, which a lot of people took issues with, but I'm kind of glad we made that decision in the early days. Uh, later on, we released uh, version 2 and started adding more and more uh, supporting libraries to it. So for example, we added a router, we added a, a CLI. Uh, so as we added these more parts, it started to become more like a framework. Um, but we still kind of loosely uh, loosely follow the, the concept that uh, it should be incrementally adoptable. So uh, it's not as uh, monolithic uh, as some other solutions, um, but also it's not no longer just a single library that does only one thing. Um, the major change in version two was the introduction of the virtual DOM as the underlying rendering layer, which opened up a, opened up a few interesting capabilities at the time, for example, server-side rendering or rendering to uh, other platforms. Uh, right now, we are hard at work in finishing up version three, which is a major rewrite, and it brings up a lot of uh, new interesting features and changes. Uh, there are so many things. Uh, so I'll just mention a few highlights here. Uh, we added the Composition API, which exposes the lower level reactivity APIs inside Vue uh, for uh, advanced logic composition and reuse in large applications. Uh, we rewrote the reactivity system using ES2515 proxies, uh, which greatly improved performance. Um, the, the rendering layer rewrite also has seen great uh, performance improvements. Uh, the bundler, um, the, the the library itself is now fully tree shaking compatible, so you will see smaller bundles. Uh, we added first class TypeScript support, more modular internal architecture for better maintenance and tooling integration. Uh, so there's a lot more. Uh, we we are we're shipping in Vue three. Uh, we're still hard at work in uh, ironing out some of the rough edges, but it's going to be ready very soon. Got it. That's great. So you've been working on the web for, for quite a while with uh, you know 2013 being the birth of Vue, and obviously you worked on the web before then. 
I'm kind of curious as you've kind of like seen the evolutions and, and seeing what's going on right now, how do you feel about web development in you know 2020? Like what are the most pressing issues? What are you focusing on? Like what are the problems that you see that web developers have and, and how do you feel like you and Vue can help there? Uh, sure. Uh, I think the, the ecosystem right now is at a transition period where we are seeing a lot of these um, new language standards features, new platform capabilities are being finally stable and consistent and shipped in all these uh, evergreen browsers. So uh, all these mainstream browsers in their latest version now have a very consistent support for these latest features. Um, and IE 11 is finally on the way of phasing out. So that sort of presents an opportunity for, uh, for new stacks or new tooling uh, to, to break free of, of the shackles of these legacy problems and sort of rethink how we can um, best take advantage of these new features that now we can finally uh, use for uh, the large majority of our users. So um, I think, uh, for example, um, uh, most of these major browsers now support native ES module imports, uh, which presents some interesting, uh, interesting technical possibilities that we can leverage uh, to to build something uh, to to sort of rethink our development workflow. Got it. Yeah, I've actually been watching you uh, in your Twitter feed there, kind of explore some of these things. Uh, I've seen you working on uh, Vite and Vite Press. I was wondering if you could uh, explain a little bit more on on uh, what these are uh, what these are doing. Sure, uh, Feet is a is a work. I would say it's a web development build tool that combines a dev server with a build step. Uh, now the interesting part is in the dev server we are leveraging the browser's native ES module import handling to provide a bundle free development experience. So instead of bundling your whole app. Uh, Vite lets the browser import your modules as needed uh, using native imports and only processes them on demand when the browser actually requests them. So this has uh, a few advantages over the traditional bundling-based dev servers. Uh, the first thing is um, when you have a large app, you may have uh, a lot of modules in your application. Uh, but when you are working on a specific part of your application, maybe you only need to import a subset of these modules. So on-demand import compilation uh, using Vite's approach allows you to only compile the necessary part for uh, modules for the part that you're actually working on. So this results in much faster uh, server startup time in large applications. The second part is uh, Vite also supports hot module replacement on top of native ES module imports. Now. Uh, with native ES module imports, uh, because we don't have to do the whole bundling uh, scope crawling uh, when we're handling hot module replacement, uh, the implementation is actually much simpler and much more efficient. Uh, so it will stay blazing fast even even uh, as your app grows, So um, which keeps the, the development feedback loop fast, uh, no matter how big your app is. Uh, so I, I, I believe this uh, really presents a... Um, an interesting option because the development experience is so close to the old days where we first got into web development, where you just have an index.html page and you import some scripts and you just get things going. Uh, Vite tries to sort of simplify the whole uh, development setup um, and and just uh, present a development experience as close to the, the original vanilla web development experience as possible. But without giving up all the modern uh, new tooling capabilities that we are used to. So uh, it's, an, it's still an interest, uh, kind of experimental at this stage, but uh, we're getting a lot of fee good feedback from users already. Got it. That's that's really exciting. I love this kind of new trend towards you know in dev time, not having to deal with bundling uh, and the like. In production, we can still obviously do a lot of that, push out all of the optimizations we can. Obviously, everything we can do to users makes sense. Um, so that's V. What about VPress? What? How does that tie into this? Oh yeah. Um, so for if you don't know VPress, uh, so VPress is a remake of ViewPress, and ViewPress is a static site generator built on top of Vue, which allows you to uh, write Markdown, use Vue components in your Markdown, and write uh, custom themes using Vue as a Vue application. Now, um, 
Viewpress was based on Webpack. So Vpress is essentially a remake of Viewpress, but using Vite as the underlying development, uh, as the underlying build tool. Um, and we took the opportunity to bake in. Uh, so, so first of all, that provides obviously a much faster uh, development experience, uh, faster server startup, faster uh, updates when you edit a page. Uh, another aspect of it is we are baking a lot of pra- performance best practices into Vpress. Uh, for example, uh, some of these, um, uh, we're seeing a lot of static site generators based on universal JavaScript frameworks, right? Uh, for example, we have uh, Next.js, which is uh, and Nux.js for Vue, which are both excellent projects. But uh, when we are using uh, server-side rendering to send static content to the client, we often face the problem of the double payload issue, where uh, you're sending the static content as HTML, but you're also sending a lot of JavaScript, which was used to render the same content, and it, which is kind of useless when it's on the client. And when then we're spending time on the client to hydrate those content using JavaScript, right? So there's a lot of room for improvement here, and Vpress. Uh, tries to tackle that. Uh, it takes advantage of Vue 3's compiler to do static analysis, uh, and we automatically detect all the static parts that won't change uh, in your page, and then uh, we sh- we concatenate them, stringify them into static strings, and eventually uh, safely remove them during the production build. So that decouples the current page JavaScript payload of your page from the content. So you're only paying for the dynamic bits inside your page, and all the static content will have no impact on the JavaScript payload size and have no impact on the client-side hydration performance. Uh, so I think that's a pretty significant um, improvement to how uh, Viewpress was handling things. Uh, and we're excited to to see how this would, uh, when we finish it, we're excited to see how much of a performance improvement this can bring to our users across the board. Got it. I have a, I have a feeling like uh, we're going to be hitting some core web vital uh, thresholds here. That sounds great. Thank you. Um, now we've got, uh, we're going live, the live stream right now to, you know, an APAC friendly uh, time zone. And we talked about how Vue is, you know, particularly popular in APAC. And I was just kind of curious on uh, what you think caused that uh, and what we can learn from that. I think Vue's popularity in, in Asia, def, in APAC, definitely has a lot to do with uh, me being Asian. Uh, personally, I am very active in the Chinese developer community as well. Um, and a lot of people probably heard about Vue through me. But uh, at the same time, I think an, uh, a more important aspect of it is good localization of our doc documentation. Um, so when, when we first uh, worked on the documentation, because I am native Chinese speaker and I know a lot of Chinese developers sort of struggle when they, uh, when they see really dense technical text written in English, uh, it's not that they cannot attempt to read it. It's just when you are, um, when you're reading something that's not in your native tongue, it's just takes so much longer. Uh, it, it makes it so much less efficient to learn. It takes much longer to to get the click when you're learning something new uh, with a, in a language that's that you're not used to, right? So, um, so I wrote the first draft, the first version of the the views documentation in Chinese, and later on, when we had a bigger community, community members started to to contribute more and more to these translations. Uh, they they. St- they started uh, taking over the maintenance of the Chinese docs, and we we're seeing a lot of contributions to translate Vue docs into other languages as well. So uh, I think this uh, this sort of good internationalization localization effort is definitely critical in uh, in helping Vue's adoption in these areas. Um, and and from my personal experience, um, what I've what I've seen is. Uh, Particularly in a lot of areas where English is not the first language, you typically see that um, the the channel for local developers to keep up to date with the latest information, to keep uh, to keep up to date with um, the new things that's uh, happening uh, in in the front end world, uh, is uh, is they sort of rely on a few key community leaders who are proficient in English to translate the content for them. Uh, uh, so it, it's great after by these community leaders, but they are not um, obliged to do this. And uh, 
when there are not enough of them, this kind of creates a bottleneck for for the content and information to flow into these uh, to to reach these developers in these areas. So so I think if uh, say a framework or uh, a, a tooling or a community that takes internationalization and localization as a first class concern, it definitely will help a lot uh, in reaching to uh, reaching these developers in, in a much bigger scale. That makes uh, a ton of sense. Uh, I've seen that on a few developer sites too. I remember one tried to add translations just through machine translation and they noticed that a lot of the developers were switching to English thinking that it was just that they were you know, familiar with English and the like. And then it was only when they went through, a lot of it was the community actually taking the time uh, to build you know, really high quality translations like you're talking about. Um, and then everyone kind of flipped back to that. So that, that makes a ton of sense. Now, before we go, I happen to notice that you're a karaoke fan, uh, as am I. And I just wanted to ask if you have a go-to song. Uh, yeah, uh, Don't Stop Me Now by Queen. Ah, nice, nice. Yeah, mine is Sweet Child of Mine. Um, so yeah, on that note, before we start singing, I'm already kind of getting ready to to jump to the mic here. Uh, we'll have to have a, a karaoke uh, session sometime. But thank you so much for joining us, Evan. Thanks for all of you do, all that you do and all that the View community does for the web. Thanks for having me. Evan just spoke about his experimentation with a bundle-free developer experience. And on day one, we spoke about the work we've been doing to understand bundlers with tooling.report. Now, understanding what's going on in these bundles is really important and is one area that we're looking to explore in Lighthouse. So please welcome Paul Irish to tell us more. Thanks, Dion. So we have all spent a good amount of time configuring our bundles and our approaching approach to bundling strategies. But ultimately, there's a lack of transparency when it comes to the JavaScript getting all bundled up and shipped into production. They're just these big files, and it's easy for us to treat them as black boxes. And some of us on the Lighthouse team have worked on community tools like Source Map Explorer, uh, Source Map Visualization, to help understand what's happening inside of these files. And we've long wanted to bring some of that inspection into Lighthouse itself. So I'm going to show you a little sneak peek of some upcoming Lighthouse features that we hope are going to help a little bit. The first one is a new audit called Remove Unused JavaScript. Now, this is actually in Lighthouse 6.0, and it is listing all by file, um, the top files that are jo top JavaScript files that are unused. Um, and it's giving you an idea of what percentage of them, how many bytes of them are actually unused. Um, this is great, and it's actually just like what you see in the coverage panel in Chrome DevTools. Um, but we can improve this if we know a little bit more about the actual JavaScript bundles. We can actually explode them and see, OK, for each bundle file, what are all of the original modules that were on disk source files and, and understand how much of them were unused and used. And this really helps us understand uh, a bit more about the kind of code that is not actually being run. Another new audit that we're introducing is one that identifies duplicate modules across JavaScript bundles. So in this case, you actually see that Lodash is in two separate JavaScript bundles. But we are really happy that this helps you see exactly um, cases where you probably could reconsider your chunking strategy to make for a little something a little bit more optimized. Another new audit is called Legacy JavaScript. Uh, what we're doing here is we're trying to find all the cases where you're shipping JavaScript to production and specifically to modern browsers where you're including things like polyfills and you're compiling down to uh, a level where the modern browsers don't really need them. Modern browsers understand a lot of modern JavaScript, and so we want to make sure that you're not overcompiling. Uh, legacy JavaScript identifies polyfills and transforms and tells you what exactly it found in each file so that you can re-optimize your deployment strategy. Got it. And is this all powered by source maps? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Source maps are, are super useful and they enable this really powerful analysis. And actually, if I can, um, we're working on a interactive UI for exploring this stuff in more detail. And so I want to show this. These are early mocks, but we wanted to provide that kind of rich 
interactive tree map experience um, inside the tool as well. Uh, so this might this UI might look a little familiar to you if you if you've used some of these tools before, um, but giving you a view of across all your JavaScript files and if there's a bundle and if we can understand what's inside of it, we'll show it and you can explore that in more detail. Uh, we're really excited to uh, provide a bunch more information around here and augment it with data around code coverage um, so that you can see exactly what's happening uh, at a table view to help prioritize all of the, the major things that you should be paying attention to um, and let you explore it in detail so you can really find out what's happening and what you could change. So again, this is early, this will all change quite a bit, but we're really excited about bringing this experience to you. Uh, it's all coming soon to a lighthouse near you. Got it. I'm always, uh, always love kind of opening up some of the old bundles and seeing all of the uh, mistakes I've made in the past. I'm excited to play around with this. Um, now, a few weeks ago, we also shipped Lighthouse 6. Um, and I believe that's the version where we now have started to include Core Web Vitals. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. All right. So Core Web Vitals, we got these three metrics, first content for paint, first input delay, and cumulative layout shift. Though it's worth pointing out that FID, first input delay, is a field metric. Um, and since Lighthouse is a lab tool, uh, in its place, we have another metric, TBT, total blocking time. We like to think of this as FID's lab companion. Uh, so they're not measuring exactly the same thing, but they're all about interactivity. They're all about long tasks on the main thread and heavily influenced by them. So uh, it really works well. So in Lighthouse 6, you'll see these three metrics up top. Uh, and if you're looking at it and your report looks like this one, um, then you're like, wow, okay, well, these metrics are, they're, they're not great. It looks like I could make some improvements here. All right, but what's the next step? We've added some new audits to help point you in the right direction. So I'll just go right through them right now. Uh, first one I'll show is this, uh, avoiding long main thread tasks. Uh, so here we're just listing the longest tasks on the main thread that you have, how long they took, and what URL we can attribute them to. Um, and then two more, we have the largest contentful paint element um, the metric itself is telling you at what time that paint happened, but that paint was associated with a particular DOM element, and here this will just tell you. And similarly, for cumulative layout shift, you want to know what the actual shifts were. Well, these were the DOM elements that shifted, um, and these ones contributed most to your total CLS value. Um, so uh, you could just read this, uh, and so like you'll see this content container. Okay, yeah, I know what that is, but then if you're looking at this, these other two items and you're like, okay, but which actual DOM element is this? If you run Lighthouse through DevTools, we actually have a nice little surprise for you. So there, we kind of upgrade these element references. So if you hover over them, we'll actually just uh, apply that element inspection hover tooltip that you normally get in DevTools. And if you click through, you'll see it in the DOM tree in the elements panel. So nice kind of integration to help you understand exactly what thing you're looking at. Anyways, this is just a small slice of all the new stuff in 6.0. Uh, please, everyone check out our blog post for all the rest of the fun stuff. Got it, I'm always a sucker for these audits. It's great to be able to kind of just go from the metrics themselves and the scores and like really go deeper yeah, to understand exactly. what's affecting them. Thanks so much, Paul. I love how we're making sure to open up as much data as we can with the Chrome user experience report. And I keep seeing great mashups and analysis from the community, such as the Onely map, which lets you kind of zoom around the world and kind of explore the performance characteristics for different device types and obviously different locations. Now, Lighthouse is a great tool to help you audit your web apps, and it helps you not only with just performance, of course, but really across the board. And we want you to be free to create the highest quality web apps that give you the biggest reach to users across whatever device they're using. Now, to hear more about the latest in PWAs and advanced capabilities, let's welcome Pete LePage. Awesome. Thanks, Dion. We believe that you should be able to build and deliver any kind of app on the web. Web apps should be able to deliver the same kinds of experiences with the same capabilities as native apps. Combining the installability and reliability of progressive web apps with our capabilities project, we're working to close the gap and help you build and deliver great experiences. 
To do that, we've been focusing on three things. First, we've been working hard to give you and users more control over the install experience, removing the mini info bar, adding an install promotion to the Omnibox, and more. But one of my favorite things about the web is how ubiquitous it is. We know that for some businesses, it's really important to have your app in the store. At Chrome Dev Summit, we previewed a library and CLI called Bubble Wrap, then called Llama Pack. It makes it trivial to get your PWA into the Play Store. In fact, PWABuilder.com now uses Bubble Wrap under the hood. In just a few mouse clicks, I can generate an APK that I can upload to the Play Store. Second, we're providing tighter integration with the operating system, like the ability to share a photo, song, or whatever else by invoking the system level share service. Or the other way around, being able to receive content from, when shared from other installed apps. You can keep users up to date or subtly notify them of new activity with app badging and make it easy for users to quickly start an action using app shortcuts, which will land in Chrome 84. And finally, we're working to enable new capabilities that enable new scenarios that weren't possible before, like editors that read and write files on the user's local file system, or getting a list of locally installed fonts so that users can use them in their design. Of course, there's plenty more, so stay tuned, but I hear, Dion, you've been playing with the TikTok PWA. That's right. Actually, it's my 10-year-old son, Josh, who started to create some really fun TikTok content, even though he was you know, pretty restricted these days to, to the house and the pets and the like. Um, and he kept bugging me to, to, to join in and, and play myself. Um, and you know, I was a little bit uh, uh, gun-shy, so to speak, on that side. But it actually gave me a great excuse to play with the really well-built PWA that the TikTok web team put together that I didn't even know about. It was really, really a nice, rich uh, experience there. That's really cool. And all of these things that we've been working on, things like the app shortcuts, are going to be a great addition to them. The idea that you can push and hold on the app icon and be able to quickly jump in and create a new TikTok or push and hold and say, hey, I want to see my friend's TikToks or the ability to be able to show app badges when a friend has posted something new or something like that. So there's plenty of great stuff coming that they can take advantage of and so can you. That's excellent. Thanks again, Pete. Thank you. Now with that, it's time to close out the last opener. It's been a great pleasure being with you over the last three days, but we're not quite done yet. We've got a great set of content coming up today. Next, you're going to hear from Google engineers who help you improve the reliability of your experience with advanced patterns for building PWAs, then how you can get them into the Play Store, and how to help you increase your conversion rate for notifications, and so much more. Now, if you're watching live, we'll be on the chat to answer your questions at web.dev live, and of course on YouTube. But the fun isn't going to end today. Thanks to our amazing Google developer groups all across the world, we've got a set of follow-up events in the weeks to come where we'll have Googlers, Google developer experts, as well as experts from across the local communities joining you to share more insights and guidance. Just check out the regional events section on web.dev live starting tomorrow to find the event that's in your time zone. Thank you so much.